Hi guys, this is part two of the test review. For this part, for chapter three, you will be allowed to use a graphing calculator, but make sure you support all your work algebraically, even if you have a correct answer. If you are missing work to support that answer, you will lose points. So make sure you're showing all of your steps. All right, so our first problem is solving a rational equation. To solve these, the first thing we want to look for is a common denominator, and even before that, you might want to look if any of these denominators um, factor further. These are all linear factors, so we not, know they're not going to factor further. You can also see x, x minus 3, through x minus 5. There's no common factors throughout, which means our least common factor or our least common denominator is just going to be all three of them, x times x minus 3 times 3x minus 5. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply that least common denominator through all of our terms. And remember, you can do this in one or two steps. I like to do it all in one step so it doesn't get too messy. When we multiply this through, it's that denominator over 1. So these factors are going to be in the numerator. And if you're doing it right, they should cancel your denominator each time. So for example, if I multiply 1 times all of these common factors, I'm going to have an x on the top. I'm also going to have an x on the bottom. So those x's will cancel, leaving me with 1, x minus 3, and 3x three minus 5. If I multiply that least common denominator through the second term, I'm going to have a 1. And then you can see I'm going to have an x minus 3 that cancels this time. So that leaves me with an x and a 3x minus 5. Finally, multiply it through our third term. This time the 3x minus 5 is going to cancel, leaving me with a 7, an x, and an x minus 3. Now I'm going to simplify what I have. We know those ones aren't going to change anything, so I'm going to start by foiling this guy together. First terms, 3x squared, outside negative 5x, inside negative 9x, last positive 15. In the next set of terms, I can just distribute my x through. That gives me a 3x squared minus 5x. And on the right, I can also distribute my x through, 7x squared minus 21x. I'm going to clean up each side a little bit here just by combining like terms. 3x squared and 3x squared give me a 6x squared. I have a negative 5x, another negative 5x, and a negative 9x. That's negative 19x plus 15. And on the other side, I have 7x squared minus 21x still. Now I can see I have a quadratic. I want to get it equal to 0. I like to keep that first term in front of my x squared positive, so I'm going to move everything over to the right. That's going to give me 0 equals 7x squared minus 6x squared gives me a 1x squared. If I add 19x over, I'm going to have a negative 2x. And if I move the 15 over, I'm going to have a negative 15. And now we solve the resulting quadratic by either factoring, square roots if you can, which we can't on this one because we have an x squared and an x term, or by using the quadratic formula if you get stuck. I am can factor this one. Two numbers that multiply to negative 15 and add to negative 2 are negative 5 and positive 3. And then if you set each of those equal to 0, you're going to get a positive 5 and a negative 3. Now it's worth checking at the end here if you have any extraneous solutions. Extraneous solutions can occur when you take these answers and plug them back into your denominators. You can see that no matter which number I plug in, I'm not going to end up with a 0 in any of these denominators, which means I do not have any extraneous solutions. If I did, I would just throw those out, and my final answers are going to be 5 and negative 3. This problem, along with a lot of other ones on this part of the test, you can check your answer more so than just checking for extraneous answers. If you have extra time, you can plug your numbers back in. Plug 5 back in on both sides, make sure you get a true statement. Plug negative 3 back in on both sides and make sure you get a true statement. Okay, our next problem is an absolute value equation. Remember with these, you first want to get the absolute value alone, which it already is. There's nothing added, subtracted, or multiplied or divided by it. If there was, we would want to move that to the other side. At this point, we're able to take our absolute value and split it into two pieces. What's inside the absolute value should not change. 5x plus 1, 5x plus 1. What it's equal to, in one case, will stay the same. 2x minus 3. 
And in the other case will be the opposite. In this case, a negative in front of my 2x minus 3. You can even take that one one step further and distribute that negative through. Negative 2x plus 3. And now we're going to solve each resulting equation. For the one on the left, I would subtract 2x. That gives me a 3x. Subtract 1. That gives me a negative 4. And then divide my 3 through. I'm going to get negative 4 thirds for my first answer. For the second one, I'm going to add 2x. That gives me a 7x. I'm going to subtract 1. That gives me a 2. And then divide through. I'm going to get a 2 sevenths. Now, it is definitely mandatory here to check your answers. Just like our rational equations, you can potentially get extraneous solutions as well with these, especially when there's a variable on the right side is when this could happen. Now, most of the time, this is going to happen when you plug a negative number in and it evaluates to a negative because, remember, an absolute value can never be equal to a negative number. So, for example, when I plug negative 4 thirds in, just on that right side, 2 times negative 4 thirds minus 3, I'm going to have negative 8 thirds minus 3, which you can, you know, keep simplifying if you want to. This is negative 17 thirds, but even before that, you can see that that right side is going to be a negative number. And we know that this left side is always going to be a positive number. So negative 4 thirds is an extraneous solution. You can also check 2 sevenths. Again, I'm just going to plug it in that right side there. 2 times 2 sevenths minus 3 is 4 sevenths minus 3, which 4 sevenths minus, I can think of that as 21 sevenths, is going to give me a negative 17 sevenths. Again, it gives me a negative number on that left side, or that right side, and that is not possible if I have an absolute value on that side. So that is also an extraneous solution meaning this problem has no solution. So definitely worth, especially when there's an x on the right side of those absolute value equations, that's when this can happen, plugging those answers back in and seeing if it makes sense for the equation that you have. All right, our next problem, we are solving a polynomial inequality. First step in these problems is we want to get it compared to 0, which it already is, so that's great. The next thing we want to do is factor it. Now, if you have four terms, the first thing you want to check for is do these terms have anything in common, a GCF, which they do not, other than a negative sign. Normally, when we have four terms, though, remember this is our grouping method. We're going to pair our terms up two and two, and we're going to factor out which e what each pair has in common. The first two terms have a negative x squared in common. And if I take a negative x squared out, that leaves me with a positive x plus 4. The next pair of terms has a 4 in common. Also leaves me with an x plus 4. And remember, that's the key to grouping is you want to end up with that same parentheses twice. So now my factors are negative x squared plus 4, the two terms I factored out, and x plus 4, the parentheses that was repeated. Now you can set each of these equal to zero to find your breaking points. If I set x plus 4 equal to zero, I get x equals negative 4. If I set negative x squared plus 4 equal to zero, I'm going to subtract 4, negative 4, divide the negative through, which gives me a positive 4, and then when I take the square root, plus and minus 2. The next thing we do in this uh, method, we call it the test point method, is we're going to make our number line and we're going to graph our breaking points, negative 4, negative 2, positive 2. And in each interval we want to test a point. Now this is a place where you could use your graphing calculator to save you some time. Um, you can put this equation in y equals and you can just use the table of values to find numbers in each of these intervals. Make sure, though, on your test, you're going to put that number line and you're going to put these test intervals showing that you use the test points in each of these ranges. If you plug in, let's say I plug in 0, I'm going to get 16. That's a quick one. So that gives me a positive number. And you're going to notice that this one will alternate sign when you test some other points. So like you could plug in negative 3, you'll see your y value is negative. If you plugged in positive 3, your y value is negative. If you plugged in negative 5, your y value would be positive. But any numbers there would work. 
Once you have your plus and minus signs, you've plugged in numbers or looked in the table of values for whether this function is positive or negative over these intervals. You're going to look back to the original function to see if, what intervals are going to be your answer. Because it's greater than zero here, we're looking for the pluses, which means I've got two intervals that make up my solution. Because my inequality sign is strictly just greater than, everything is going to be a parenthesis here. Your answer in interval notation would then be negative infinity to negative 4 and negative 2 to 2. The next problem is also an inequality problem. This time we've got our rational inequalities, very similar. We're going to start by making sure it's compared to 0, which it is. Then we're going to factor the numerator and denominator. The numerator will factor to x plus 5, x plus 5, two numbers that multiply to 25 and add to 10. Denominator is a little trickier because you have a number in front of the x squared here. I'm going to walk you through how we can kind of guess and check. You could also use the grouping method or the box method. Um, worst case scenario, remember if you get stuck on the factoring, you can just use the quadratic formula and that will take you straight to the breaking points. Now I'm looking for two numbers that multiply together to get a 2x squared. That's a 2x and an x. Then I need two numbers that multiply to negative 5. Well, I don't, I don't have a lot of options there. It's either well, 1 and 5, where 1 is positive and 1 is negative, or vice versa. I need a positive and a negative. 1's a 1, 1's a 5. Um, in this case, we're trying to find numbers where the outside and the inside give me a negative 3 when I put those together. So let's see, if I do a negative 5 here, I'll have a negative 5x for my inside terms. I do a positive 1 here, I'll have a 2x for my outside terms, and 2x and negative 5x are going to give me that negative 3 I'm looking for, so I know I factored that correctly. Again, if you get stuck with the factoring, use the quadratic formula, and it's going to take you straight to the breaking points. The breaking points for the denominator, if I set the first factor equal to 0, are 5 halves, or 2.5 we'll say and negative 1 from the second factor. Now remember those ones we're going to say not equal to because those are domain restrictions. They come from the denominator. In my numerator, I actually only have one breaking point because this value repeats at negative 5. Go to your number line. Put those breaking points on there. Negative 5, negative 1, and 2.5. And, and then we're going to test values in each of these intervals. For this one, I'll show you how you can use the calculator. So we're going to go to y equals, and let me make sure my plot's off from what I did before. Okay, so I'm going to hit alpha y equals to get my fraction set up. Numerator x squared plus 10x plus 25. My denominator is 2x squared minus 3x minus 5. And now I'm going to go to my table. And I'm looking for first value smaller than negative 5, so I'm going to have to scroll down here. Anything smaller than negative 5, we're looking at the y values over here, and you can see all of those y values are positive numbers. So my first interval is positive. Then I'm looking for numbers between negative 5 and negative 1, and you can see those numbers are also positive. So this is an example where we don't always alternate sign. Then at negative 1, between negative 1, and you can see negative 1 is telling me an error. That's a good sign because that's a breaking point. It should. It's a domain restriction. Um, it looks like all of my values are negative in that interval. And then larger than 2.5, you can see I'm getting all positive numbers there, so plus. In this problem, it says greater than or equal to, so we're looking for the positives. We have 3 intervals in this case that make up my solution. The inequality sign is equal to, which means we're going to use a bracket at every number except 2.5 and, and negative 1 because those are domain restrictions. So my answer is negative infinity to negative 5, negative 5 has a bracket, negative 5 to negative 1, negative 1 is a domain restriction, it has a parenthesis, and two and a half with a parentheses because it's a domain restriction to infinity. Now, a way you could also condense this a little bit more because five has a bracket, meaning we're allowed to equal five. You can also just say negative infinity to negative one. You don't have to write this as two separate intervals, although it's not wrong if you write it like that. And then again, two and a half to infinity. So that would be our final answer. Okay. Next problem is an absolute value 
inequality. So first thing we're going to do on this one is we're going to get that absolute value alone. I'm going to take the absolute value of 3x plus 1 and put the 5 in front of it. I'm going to move the 4 to the other side. That gives me a 10. Then I'm going to divide both sides by 5. Remember, at any point in an inequality, if you divide by a negative, you flip the sign. But I'm dividing by a positive right now, so we're okay. And once your absolute value is alone, you're ready to split it into your two pieces. What's inside the absolute value, just like the equations, doesn't change. 3x plus 1, 3x plus 1. On one side, we're going to set it equal to the number that we see, positive 2. On the other side, we're going to set it equal to the opposite number, in this case, negative 2. If we don't change the number, we don't change the sign. So it's going to be less than 2. If we do change the number, that's like multiplying by a negative 1. So my sign's going to flip. The other thing you want to remember with these problems is it's a compound inequality that we're going to combine together with an and or an or statement. Good way to remember how to combine them together is worth the word goal. If it's a greater than symbol, you're going to use um, uh, or. If it's a less than symbol, you're going to use an and. So my absolute value is less than the number 2, which means we are going to use an and to connect my two inequalities here, which ultimately means we're going to be looking for the intersection or what these two problems have in common. All right, I'm going to go ahead and solve each inequality by subtracting two, or subtracting one from two, and dividing by three gives me one third for the first one. On the other side, I'm going to subtract one, that gives me negative three, divide by three, that gives me a negative one. If it helps with these problems, graph it on a number line so you can see that intersection. I'm looking for all values less than one-third, which would look something like this. And then also values that are greater than negative one, which would look like that. And because it's an and statement, we're looking for the intersection, the part that gets shaded twice, what they have in common, which in this case is negative one to one-third. Remember, if you have an or st statement, you're looking for a union, which means anywhere that the graph was shaded would be your solution. So if this was an or statement, my answer would actually be all real numbers because my entire number line is shaded and therefore part of the solution. For the next one, we are using Descartes' rule of signs. This was where you're calculating the possible number, so not the actual zeros, but the number of positive and negative zeros. To find the possible number of positive zeros, we're looking for changes of sign. My first term is positive, my second term is positive, that is not a change of sign. Now my third term is negative, that's one change of sign. My fourth term is negative, not a change of sign. My fifth term is positive, that's a change of sign. And my final term is also positive. So as I read these terms from left to right, there are two times that my signs change from positive to negative or negative to positive. So the possible number of positive zeros is 2, or as the theorem says, less than that by an even integer, which means we're just going to keep subtracting 2 until it doesn't make sense anymore. So if I subtract 2 from that, I get 0. If I keep subtracting 2 from that, I'm going to end up with a negative quantity. That doesn't make sense, so that's how I know to stop. To find the possible number of negative zeros, you first need to evaluate f of negative x. And we did this a lot when we were doing um, symmetry, even odd. We're going to plug negative x in for all of our x's, and we're going to simplify the function. Remember, if you take negative x to an odd power, it's negative. If you take negative x to an even power, it's positive. The first term will be negative. The second term will be positive. The third term will be positive. The fourth term will be negative. The fifth term will be negative and the final term would be positive. So now let's look at those signs. Negative to positive, change of sign. Positive to positive, not a change of sign. Positive to negative, it changed. Did not change. My final pair did change. So this time we have three possible negative zeros or less than that by an even integer. So I subtract two, I get one. Subtract 2 again, I'm in the negatives, it doesn't make sense, so that's how I know to stop. There are either 3 or 1 negative zeros, which means negative x-intercepts on this graph. All right, the next two problems are our p's and q's. So we are finding all real roots for this problem, and it says you need to use the rational roots theorem, which is the p's and q's and synthetic division. You're getting points for showing all of those steps in the process. Rational roots 
starting with my p's. P's come from your constant term. In this case, is 1, so I only have one value of p, 1. Q's come from my leading coefficient. In this case, that's 2, so 1 and 2. All my possible p's over q's are plus and minus 1, plus and minus 1 half. The second step, which is why you have a graphing calculator on this part of the test, is you should then graph this function. So let's go ahead and do that. 2x to the fourth minus 7x to the third plus 5x squared plus x minus 1. And we're going to look for any potential x-intercepts that are in this p over q list. Now, right now, I don't have a giant p over q list. Oh, let me hit zoom 6, get a better window. There we go. Um, but it still helps a little bit to check this out. So let's see. Um, it looks like positive 1 is maybe an x-intercept, maybe even a half could be an x-intercept, even negative a half. So I'm going to write all of those down. I'm going to start probably, I'm just going to say from the graph, maybe positive 1, maybe negative a half. Looks like it could be an x-intercept. Um, and then we'll check that for sure with our synthetic division. Setting up your synthetic division, make sure you're not missing any powers, which we're not in this case. So we're just going to put our coefficients 2, negative 7, 5, 1, and negative 1. And then let's try 1 first. Bring my first term down. Multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add. Perfect. So 1 is my first answer. Let's try negative a half. Remember, if something doesn't work, you just erase it and try a different number. 2 times negative a half is negative 1, which gives me negative 6. Negative 6 times negative a half is 3, which gives me 3. Times negative a half is negative 1.5, and that is not going to give me a remainder of 0. All right, that's not good. Let's try maybe positive a half. There we go. Okay. So positive a half times 2 gives me 1. Add those together, I get negative 4. Times a half gives me negative 2. Negative 2. Multiply. Negative 1. Add 0. Great. All right, so 1 half is my next answer. Now I started out with a degree 4 polynomial, and I did synthetic division two times, which now brings me down to a degree 2 polynomial, which is always our goal here. We want that quadratic. 2x squared minus 4x minus 2 equals 0, and now we want to solve it. I'm going to look to see if I can factor first. Now, everything's divisible by a 2, so I'm at least going to do that. Divide through a 2. And now if I'm looking to factor, I'm trying to find two numbers that multiply to negative 1 and add to negative 2. Well, that doesn't work with integers. So my only option now is to solve using the quadratic formula to get those last two answers. Opposite of b, positive 2, plus and minus square root b squared is 4, minus 4 times a times c, all over 2a times 1. I get 2 plus and minus, it'll be the square root of 8 over 2. I can break that radical down further into 4 and 2, so 2 red 2 over 2. And then all my whole numbers are divisible by 2, so that's going to reduce 2. I'll write it over here, 1 plus and minus rad 2. So make sure when you're writing your final answer, if you have a degree 4 polynomial, you've got four solutions, and those four solutions are 1, 1 half, 1 plus rad 2, and 1 minus rad 2 that you're going to put on your answer line. Okay, let's look at the next one. It's going to be very similar. Start with your P's and Q's. P's, factors of your constant 30 here are 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 10, 15, and 30. Q's, factors of your leading coefficient are 1. And all my P's over Q's then are going to be whole numbers here. Plus and minus 1, plus and minus 2, plus and minus 3, plus and minus 5, plus and minus 6, plus and minus 10, plus and minus 15, plus and minus 30. Now you can see we're getting a big list, so definitely worth, worth graphing and narrowing this down. 
x to the fourth minus 4x cubed minus 5x squared plus 38x minus 30. Let's go ahead and graph that. And it looks like I got a couple options, negative 3 and positive 1. Let's write that down from the graph. I'm thinking negative 3 and positive 1, and we will test those with our synthetic division. So my coefficients for my synthetic division are 1, negative 4, negative 5, 38, negative 30. I am not missing any terms, but if you were, don't forget that 0 is a placeholder. You will get really frustrated with these problems. Your synthetic division is not going to work out if you are um, missing that 0. All right, so let's try negative 3 first. Bring it down. 1, negative 3, negative 7. 21, 16, negative 48, negative 10, positive 30, and 0. So that worked. Let's try the next one. 1, just keep making it smaller and smaller each time. 1, negative 6, 10, and that gives me a remainder of 0. Perfect. So I had a degree 4 polynomial. I did synthetic division two times. I am now left with x squared minus 6x plus 10. Let's factor it. Um, two numbers that multiply to negative 10 and add to negative 6. Unfortunately, it does not factor. All right, so we're going to use our quadratic formula. Get those last two answers. Oh, let me get a different color here. x equals... Opposite of b6, plus and minus square root, b squared is 36, minus 4 times a is 1, times c is 10, all over 2 times a, 2 times 1. Under that square root, I have 36 minus a 40, that's going to give me a negative 4, all over 2 in the bottom. Square root of negative 4 gives me a 2i. And then everything there is divisible by 2, so I'm left with 3 plus and minus i. So you have four answers again for this one. Make sure you get all of those on the answer line. Negative 3, positive 1, and 3 plus and minus i. All right, our last problem. We're going to find the end behavior of this rational function. Now I'm going to number them here. You definitely don't have to number them on the test, but it is helpful to keep your work organized, and I'm just numbering them left to right. Remember, for each of these, you're going to want an x and a y with an arrow for x approach. All right, so let's start with n behavior number one. x approaches, and instead of y, I'll put f of x will be correct here. As I go further to the left, my x is approaching negative infinity, and you can see I have a horizontal asymptote drawn at negative 2. That's what my y is approaching. And behavior number two, this time your x is approaching a vertical asymptote as you go from left to right. And that vertical asymptote is at negative one. It's very important that if your x is approaching a vertical asymptote, you also include in this little kind of exponent a plus or a minus, and that describes if you're on the left or the right side. Um, and behavior number two is on the left side, so we use a little minus. If you do not have that minus there, it will be marked wrong. So make sure you're very careful with the notation. That guy's going up forever, so my y approaches positive infinity. And behavior number three, down at the bottom. Again, we are approaching the vertical asymptote at negative one, but this time we're on the right side. My f of x this time is going down, approaching negative infinity. And behavior number four is approaching a vertical asymptote at 3, and it's on the left side. My y is approaching negative infinity. And behavior number 5, also approaching 3, but it's on the right side. My y is approaching infinity. It's going up. And then last but not least, and behavior number six is going to the right forever. So my x is approaching positive infinity. My y 
is approaching my horizontal asymptote at negative 2. And that's the end of the problem that you guys are going to see on day two of your chapter three test. Remember, you've got a lot of extra practice problems in Polaris that you can use at home with the solutions, or you can practice in class on our test review day, and you can always see me with any extra questions.